I'm Anthony W. Robbins, and I'm an author and historian of New York City. I'm Sam Roberts, urban affairs correspondent of The New York Times. When you walk out of the subway, you can see Grand Central coming up from Park Avenue. That central arch, well, actually all three of them, but particularly the central arch, is very visible for anybody walking up Park Avenue from the south. Whitney Warren was an American architect who'd studied in Paris and brought back a Parisian sensibility. Grand Central really looks like a French building that's been dropped on a corner of 42nd and Park. The facade is spectacular, but first we're going to go inside. We're going to walk under the Pershing Square viaduct here. This is one of the major entrances to the terminal, which may sound odd because one of the chief goals of the architects was to have a grand experience. You are entering New York, you should be overwhelmed. And if you're coming from outside of the city, you will be. But we're already in Midtown, so the station really doesn't care what we think. We're going to walk in now through the uh, foyer. The entranceway here is dedicated to Jacqueline Onassis, and that is a fitting tribute because she helped save the terminal after Penn Station was demolished. As you turn to the left, you will see a plaque on the wall commemorating her involvement with the rescuing of the terminal. The preservation battle to keep it standing was extremely important in the history of historic preservation generally. It was a Supreme Court decision that upholding New York City's landmarks preservation law kept the uh, terminal standing. When you look at the decorations on the walls at Grand Central, you'll see acorns. The Vanderbilts adopted the acorn as the family symbol from little acorns, mighty oaks like the Vanderbilts grew. You'll also notice behind it is a clock. There are clocks everywhere. Why? Because if I want to catch the 502, I don't really care what time my watch thinks it is. I want to know what time Grand Central thinks it is. The wreaths that you see just above the doorway have in the center a caduceus, the winged stick with the snakes running around it. And we generally think of that as a symbol of medicine, which it is, but it's also a symbol of commerce. It's not used that way anymore, but in 19th and early 20th century buildings, any commercial building, chances are you'll find a caduceus. If we head down this ramp, we're heading toward the main concourse of the terminal. This is Vanderbilt Hall. This used to be the main waiting room of the terminal. When you look up, you see all those light bulbs and you say, this is a grand central terminal. Why are there raw, naked light bulbs there? When the Vanderbilts built Grand Central Terminal, they wanted to show off the fact that Grand Central was electrified. Remember, that was unusual in 1913. One of the things I always find fascinating is I really have to look very hard to find a bulb that is out. They are very well maintained. The chandelier weighs a ton and a half. They're remarkable structures because really each bulb is taking the place of what would have been a candle in an earlier form. The general layout of this space is meant to look like a Greek temple with enormous piers on either side and then holding up a ceiling. That, of course, is an illusion. This is a steel cage structure, just like any skyscraper. Now we've left Vanderbilt Hall, and once again, we've found ourselves coming down a ramp, which in turn is over other ramps, which go to the lower levels. And this leads us into the main concourse. This is by far the largest and grandest space in Grand Central. So as we walk into this extraordinary space, just stop and look around. It is enormous. It's almost like a secular cathedral. The ceiling is 120 feet high at the top, and the intention was to impress visitors arriving in the city. That concourse is about 42,000 square feet. You'll notice it has glass everywhere. There are enormous windows, but there are also skylights. Get there at the right time of day, and you can actually see the sunlight streaming into the room. This is a very well-planned terminal. You walk in from the main entrance on Park Avenue, you find your way to the main waiting room. Beyond that is the tickets, and then there's the information booth, and beyond that is the tracks. You can be on your train in two minutes. This is actually one of two information booths. The other one is directly below it on the lower concourse, and they are connected by a spiral staircase in the center of the space, which nobody else gets to see or use. It's really a private staircase. Above is the famous four-faced clock. When someone says, meet me at Grand Central, there was only one place to meet. Now, if you look up at the long wall, you will see five lunette windows rising above it. And above and next to the windows are sculpted ornament. When you look at those friezes over the arched windows, you can see locomotive wheels, you can see wings. And the whole theme of the terminal is travel, commerce, speed, delivery of services, this sense of unlimited travel, of space, of time. That's what the terminal was all about. All of the decorative sculpture was done by Sylvain Cellier. His work is all over the terminal. That same sense of transportation shows up in the choice of subject for the ceiling, which shows the constellations. If you go back several hundred years, captains of boats needed to navigate by looking at the skies and looking at the stars. So no train engineer has ever had to do that, but it says navigation and that's the reason for the choice. 
Now, the painters who worked on this worked with a professor of astronomy from Columbia, except that within a few weeks of its opening, a commuter who happened to be an amateur astronomer looked up and said, you know, that representation of the sky, it's upside down and backwards. So that was a little embarrassing. The stars include 61 that look really bright. That's because they're actually light bulbs. Paul Cesare Lu, the Frenchman who designed the ceiling, insisted that there be uh, actual electric lights in the ceiling. Remember that electric lights was still fairly new, so electricity and lighting was very exciting. Another spot of interest in the ceiling is a blackened rectangle, and that is the color that the ceiling was before it was cleaned in the 1990s. Of course, people often ask, well, what was all that soot from? Was it from the trains? And of course, it couldn't be because the trains are electrified. So it was taken to a lab, and they discovered that it was tar and nicotine. It was 100 years of cigarette smoke. Now, if you go to Grand Central today, you'll find signs that suggest there are three separate train lines here. There's the New Haven line, the Hudson line, and the Harlem line. And these were originally three very separate lines. So when you look up above the ticket booths at the uh, listings of train departure times, the departure times listed are always one minute before the actual departure times. That dates back to the uh, use of gates at each of the uh, entrances to the tracks. The gates closed one minute before departure time, so that's the time that's being shown on the boards. And although the gates are no longer there, the time remains one minute behind. If you then turn around, look across the uh, concourse, you will see the entrances to the tracks. It's interesting, of course, that this is a terminal, not a station. It is a terminal because trains terminate there as opposed to a station where they pass through. We're walking now eastward in what's called the Graybar Passageway. There's a mural on the ceiling, which has been there from the beginning. And what it shows is train transportation. It's faded a little bit with time, but this was a concept that the art on buildings should reflect what the building is about. And if this is a train terminal, then the art should reflect transportation as it does. As you look in the gate here for track 16 and 17, you can see that the low ceiling, this is where the trains come in and the trains are directly beneath Park Avenue. Today, all the trains out of Grand Central are commuter trains, but when it was originally set up, the idea was that the upper level would be for long distance express trains like the 20th Century Limited to Chicago, and commuter trains would all be on the lower levels. One of the great things and one of the innovations at Grand Central was that it was a double deck station. It had an upper and lower level for the tracks, which made it at the time the largest terminal in the world. It also had a loop so that trains didn't have to back in and out. They could loop around without having to turn around we can head down to the dining area. So we're walking down the ramp from the main concourse. Ramps were so new when the terminal was built that they actually had to define them. And ramps come from the word ramparts. Again, this was the great stairless terminal. This was very carefully planned. It was done with tests. Ramps at different slopes were set up and then people were set to walk up and down them. A very large person, somebody with children, somebody carrying packages to ensure that the ramp would be at the best slope to get people moving, but they wouldn't fall over. You'll notice that you can look up from this level and see the entire height of the terminal above you. We're coming down into the Whispering Gallery and you can look up and see that Gustavino ceiling designed by Raphael Gustavino, this patented interlocking tile ceiling, which is an innovation at Grand Central. Those are Gustavino tiles. This is a technology of thin tile and cement, which is in fact is extremely strong. There are no steel beams holding up that pedestrian bridge, which is what's going over our head. It's all done by the angles at which the tiles interlock. Apparently by accident, it's a very echoey space. If you stand in one corner of this whispering gallery, your voice will be carried across the parabolic ceiling toward the other side. Just go ahead and whisper facing the wall in one side, give it a try and have someone standing at the other side. Chances are they will hear exactly what you're saying. Can you hear me? Now if you turn left, you'll see the entrance to the Oyster Bar restaurant. It was the original tenant when Grand Central opened in 1913. This would have been called the Ratskeller. It's a tradition in German-speaking countries that city halls, the Rathaus, will have a uh, cheap place to eat in the cellar, a uh, sausage and a stein of beer. That idea caught on in New York and other places in the late 19th century. This is one of the few left, I think, of these Ratskeller-type restaurants that's still in use. And if we turn around, we can walk to the other tracks on the lower level of the terminal and the new food court area. Half the people wandering around here, chances are they're not coming from or going to trains. They're coming to eat. 
Every inch of the terminal has been monetized to help pay for $350 million and climbing of restoration work in the terminals. This is the lower information booth, the one that's connected to the upper information booth connected by that spiral staircase. Unless you're really hungry, let's head back upstairs to the main concourse. We're going to stop here for a moment and we will see the elevators. We're going to take the elevator up. Take a left as you get off the elevator, and you can go to the Campbell Apartments. That's probably a misnomer. The Campbell Apartment was never an apartment. It was an office. It was built for Mr. Campbell, who was a financier, who by rights should have had his office down on Wall Street. But he wanted something in Midtown, and the story goes that he was talking to his realtor and saying, I really want something spectacular here in Midtown. And this realtor threw up his hands and said, well, what do you want, Grand Central Terminal? And he said, yes, yes, that's exactly what I want, Grand Central. The Campbell apartment is 3,500 square feet, one big room, which is not a bad size for somebody's office. Campbell brought in his own architect and designed what you now see, including a beamed ceiling modeled on a Roman Renaissance ceiling. There's a fireplace that looks like it comes out of an estate somewhere in the shires of England. Medieval looking glass for the windows by the bar this wonderful office, which was a replica of a Florentine palazzo. It had a great fireplace, a piano, an organ. It is now a very fancy bar. And it's one of the most beautiful places to have a cocktail anywhere in New York City. If you head out these doors, you'll go to the area where taxis used to pick up passengers. There is an entrance from Vanderbilt Avenue. Taxis can't go there anymore. There are safety bollards. But it's a very dramatic way to enter the terminal. We walk through the doors, and you're at the top of the large staircase at the western end of the main concourse, and you suddenly realize it's sunk below ground, a full story, which is why it's possible to be on the main concourse and then enter the tracks from that point, because you are underground. Here's where you really get a feel of the grandeur, the spaciousness of this great public space. And again, you just look at this urban choreography, this urban ballet on the main concourse. We'll walk down the staircase back into the main concourse and turn around and look at the staircase. This is a great stairless terminal, but there are two major staircases. This one at the west end of the main concourse, and then what looks like a twin at the east end. This one at the West End was modeled on the grand staircase of the Paris Opera. What you're looking at are windows, but they're actually two sets, and there's enough room between them for a glass walkway, and you're seeing somebody walk across the walkway. The staircase at the East End is 100 years younger than the staircase at the West End. The plan had originally been for a staircase at either end. This is a very symmetrical space. But the original architects felt that the staircase had no place to go on the east. It would just go up and basically end. So it never got built. A hundred years later, Bayer Blinder Bell, the restoration architects, looked at the plans, saw it as a symmetrical space, saw that the plans existed for that staircase and said, you know what, we're gonna put it in. We're gonna complete the design. The staircases were supposed to match, but if you look very carefully, they do not. One of the anomalies at Grand Central Terminal the reason for that mostly is because the second staircase, when it was built, had to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. At either end, and actually all four corners of the main concourse, you can't really tell looking at them, but there are four small office buildings there. So these office buildings were rented out to outside entities. Today it's mostly train related. But one of the early uses, 1937, CBS Network, the television network, had its first television station here. The reason it was here was because their antenna was on the Chrysler Building, which is just across the street. When Walter Cronkite, for instance, first worked for CBS, he came to Grand Central for work. Later, there was a tennis court, there was an art school, there was an art gallery. So there have been all kinds of uses in those spaces. Now we're walking toward Vanderbilt Hall, and we'll walk out again onto 42nd Street. 
Pershing Square, named after the World War I general who visited Grand Central for a number of occasions. In fact, he was one of the people who used the secret siding, Platform 61, which has also been used by presidents who were staying at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. That has been a method of escape for them in case they ever had to escape, in case the street access was blocked. There was direct access from the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. So we're going to walk out to 42nd Street, turn right, cross the street, and look back at the corner entrance. The eagle that you see there, it actually was from one of the earlier versions of Grand Central. They were discovered, brought back, and you'll find them placed at various points around the terminal today. As you look at the main facade on 42nd Street, I think my eye goes straight to the uh, huge statuary group at top, which, when it was first put up, was the largest sculpture group in North America. When you look at that sculpture, which was actually made in Long Island City, Queens, it's about 1,500 tons Indiana limestone, and it includes the figures of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, Hercules, the god of strength, and Mercury, the god of commerce and transportation, all combined in this monumental sculpture. Directly beneath the statue of Mercury is the enormous clock, which is 13 or 14 feet in diameter. The glass front has been replaced, but it was originally designed by Tiffany. It was the largest Tiffany timepiece in the world. And just to give you a sense of the size, the number six at the bottom, which is the upside down VI, that looks like a little square, that's actually a door. When the clock has to be serviced, that door opens and people come out through it. When Grand Central was built, it was blocking what became Park Avenue. So William Wilgus, the chief engineer, designed a viaduct that went all the way around Grand Central so Park Avenue could continue from north to south. So this viaduct, what's called the Pershing Square Viaduct, lifts traffic both north and southbound up from Park Avenue to the terminal and then separates into roads. The road around the left is for traffic coming south. The road around on the other side is for traffic going north. And it just tells us so much about how important it is in New York that the traffic keeps flowing. The Pershing Square Viaduct modeled on a bridge in Paris, the Alexander III Bridge. Also on the viaduct level at Grand Central, you could see the larger-than-life statue of Commodore Vanderbilt, who was, of course, the founder of the New York Central Lines. It's small because it's a question of scale. It wasn't meant to be here. It was originally on an earlier depot of the New York Central that was downtown. And on that depot, it looked enormous. That depot was gone. The statue was moved up here as a representation of the man who gave us the New York Central, which eventually created Grand Central. Remember that this is an entire transportation hub. Grand Central is by far the biggest and most visible part of it. But there are other train lines here. What is now the number seven train from Times Square to Queens, IRT four, five, and six. So between pedestrian traffic, commuter and long distance traffic, and subway traffic, this was a huge transportation hub, a really complex point that continues to function brilliantly. It had an enormous effect. It shifted the center of gravity of Manhattan from downtown to uptown by the very nature of its building. It created commuting, if you will. The very word commuting was established or defined at Grand Central. This is one of the great public spaces, one of the great landmarks of New York.